All right, we're going to move right into this. George Brown, Rachel Knoll, Wellington Webb, Gloria Tanner, Regis Groff, Ari Taylor, Rosemary Marshall, Paul Hamilton, Wilma Webb, Odell Barry, Elvin Caldwell, Benny Milliner, Sharon Bailey, Hiawatha Davis, Sam Williams, both Penfield Tates, junior and senior, Ben Clark, Edna Mosley, King Trimble, Bill Roberts, Gloria Holiday, Omar Blair. These folks stand on the shoulders of those black elected officials before us. Let's thank those people who've come before. <laughs> what we've asked these folks to do, and I'm not sure if this has ever happened before from a historical perspective to have this many black elected officials in the room at one time talking about issues that impact our community. The questions that were posed to our elected officials, in your sphere of politics, what are the policies and programs that currently address the disparities identified in the Losing Ground Report? Are there other policies and programs you would propose? And what will your office do in the future to assist in addressing the identified disparities? And are you willing to work with partnership with the Colorado Rock Roundtable to help the African American community in Colorado regain the ground that they've lost? The questions first proposed to our mayor, Michael Hancock. Thank you, John, and, and thank you to all of you for giving up time on your Saturday to be here. Um, I think it's a very timely and, and appropriate conversation for us as a community. Has been for quite some time, actually. Uh, I want to acknowledge the sponsors who helped put this on, certainly to our honorable chairs, uh, the lovely, the honorable Gloria Tanner, as well as the great senator. Both of them were great senators in the state of Colorado, certainly Senator Regis Groff. <laughs> I know that we would not, um, none of us up here can, can move forward without ever thinking about the role that Senators Tanner and, and Groff, as well as the other elected officials that John named. Um, all of us, I can tell you, I met every one of those people that he named, and every one of them gave time and, and simply said, he's not heavy, I can help lift you and show you uh, what it means to be a servant. So we owe a great deal of gratitude to our uh, pioneers who came before us. Listen, I can sit here today and I can talk about the fact that since coming into office in July of 2011, we've created 15,000 jobs in the city of Denver. 1,000 new businesses have started in the city of Denver. Uh, we've begun to narrow the achievement gap in the city and county of Denver. There were 71,000 kids in Denver Public Schools when I was elected. Today, there are 84,000 kids uh, coming back to the city public school system, record number. Um, I could tell you that um, we've been able to invest some $73 million since I took the oath of office in our children in this city. $73 million. <laughs> Trying to create really that circle of care and circle of opportunity for our young people. 2,500 kids went to work this past summer uh, through the Mayor's Summer Youth Employment Program. When I came into office, 200 kids were going to work during the Summer Youth Employment Program. So we're making investments where they matter. When I came into office, young people had to pay a membership fee, about $30 a year, to go to our rec centers and our pools. Those of us new who grew up in this city know that rec centers and pools are the center and the heartbeat of our city and have always been. And unfortunately, we created an artificial barrier by saying you must pay a membership, and so kids simply didn't go. Today, I can tell you that thanks to these members of city council who sit up here with me today, we removed that barrier, and we created through the My Denver Car free access to Denver's rec centers and pools. We thought in March when we launched the program, 25,000 kids would sign up in one year. By July, well over 30,000 kids in the city and county of Denver were participating in our parks and rec programs. So I can talk about all those good things, and we're going to continue to focus on education. We're going to continue to focus on economic development and economic opportunity. We're going to continue to focus on housing issues. 
My 2014 budget calls for a $3 million initial investment to begin to build more affordable, accessible housing in the city and county of Denver. My uh, budget also continues to call for uh, the hiring of more police officers in Denver, particularly in our growing neighborhoods in this city. But I, I want to say something a little differently. Good things are happening in the city. I sat for two long sessions with the reporters and the researchers of losing ground. And I reflected on my times with the Urban League and that great venerable movement. And I reflected on my time, eight years on city council and now two years as mayor. And a lot of the same issues we were trying to address in the Urban League and city council we're still trying to address today. It's the same issues that Senator Tanner and Senator Groff talked about, John Bailey talked about when I was just a knee high to his ankle. And we were running back and forth to Red Shield. We have been in these sessions before. And the one thing that I said to those interviewers that we seem to not want to address more candidly is that we as an African American community have lost the Big Papa syndrome in our community. And what I mean by that is when we were growing up, my mother's and my mother's mother talked about no matter how difficult things got in the house or even in the job, Big Papa never lost it, left his kids. And the fact that the breakdown of our family correlates with the widening of the gaps is not a mistake. And if we are going to be honest about addressing these issues, the mayor can address them. I can go and talk about equality and equity and opportunity and economics and education. Councilman Brooks can talk about opening rec centers. The state legislature can say we're going to bring more MD, MWBE programs and ACDB programs to, to bear. But if an, as an African American community, we don't get serious about black men staying in their families, we will never move the lever. <laughs> staying with their kids. You know, Mary Louise and I talk all the time. We got married at 23 years old. We've been married this past July 20 years. And, and we'll be the first to tell you, as my mama said, life ain't been no crystal stare. But the one thing we were hell-bent on, that we were going to stay together for these children and make sure they were raised in a healthy, loving environment. And that's why... When we sent our young son last week to Atlanta Institute of Music and walked away and said, we've done the best we can, it's on you now. It was that fighting through difficult, challenging times, that Big Papa syndrome. No matter what went down, I'm still your daddy, and I'm going to get you through this. And I just want us to be honest about the fact that as we have this conversation, as elected officials, we will never forget the fact we're African American. Every morning we wake up, we're reminded. And oftentimes the media reminds us too. But what we don't, what we cannot do, as much as we speak from these bully pulpits, is to encourage our families to stay together so that our children grow up healthier in healthier environments and have better opportunities. And it's proven time and time again, families that pray together, stay together, kids get better and they do better. So I just want to put that on the table. And that's just real talk. That's not rose-colored conversation. This is real family conversation. It's about the family. And if you go back and you look at these numbers and you begin to see the regression, you begin to see the escalation of single parenthood that occurs throughout the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I just want to thank all of you guys uh, for being out here and being engaged and being in the room um, and the Colorado Black Roundtable for bringing this alert to the community. We need to be alerted. Uh, but last night, for me, was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call to our entire community. Um, and, and the fact that it was, it was on the night before coming in here uh, sets the mood and sets the tone that we, we, we can't play anymore. We can't just have these conversations and walk out of here and feel all good of what we've been doing. We got to implement. So I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase and just say, 
and say the reality. The reality is we can't have these lofty policy macro visions because oftentimes they don't get to the east side of Denver in 80205 and over here. <laughs> and and I, I'm witnessing that firsthand, for example, with, with our MWBE goals, right, which is a great program. We see that there's a disparity within our own African-American community within those goals. So even our best intentions sometimes even fall short. And so from a city council perspective, I get the opportunity to both link up and be a part of the macro vision of what we're doing as a city, which our mayor highlighted, and then put together micro goals that impact our community. For example, 80205 has one of the highest uh, unemployment and prison reentry rates in the city. And so what we did off of uh, the mayor's uh, jo summer jobs program is we did a program for 30 young people who had misdemeanors and felonies to hire jobs and they had to live within 80205. And so we had 30 folks and we talked about that. And everybody said, you just had 30 folks, but they're from our community. And they stayed in their jobs the whole summer. <laughs> for a macro opportunity that I see coming for Northeast Denver is probably the biggest investment, uh, the most strategic focus from the mayor's office. And it's this Northeast Denver uh, collaborative that we're doing which focuses on Brighton Boulevard and I-70, and it's gonna include most of Northeast Denver. Um, we're gonna invest, CDOT is gonna invest $2.4 billion in I-70. Our rail line is gonna invest $1.3 billion, and this has all come through our community. We're redoing our stock show. All of this is gonna be money in our community. We need to have a focus plan that we put together that impacts individuals from our community. And so one of the things that I want to propose is where the, these contractors who are coming on board to work, whether it be Kiwit, whether it be all these constructing contractors, that they would specifically come and do a forum like this for us and tell us all the different job opportunities. And since you are in our community and you're putting this together, how are you going to implement us within this economic development plan that you're doing? So those are, I know all of us have some amazing ideas, so I'm gonna I'm pass it on, but I'll just say this. My, uh, my mother, and I, I tell this story all the time, my mother was the first African-American born in Lake Village, Arkansas, in the hospital. They put her, they put her in a cage so she wouldn't contaminate the rest of the black babies. She, br she grew up, in, in that era of the Little Rock Nine. And, uh, but she grew up with a lot of anger and, and she became a panther in Chicago. And she, <laughs> hold on, let me get through the story before you clap. She, she, she grew up in, as a panther in Chicago. And one of the things she said um, after she got her PhD from UCLA in education, she said, the movement lost its power when we got jobs. The movement lost its power when we got educated. And as I'm looking at all of this data and all of this information, one of the things that I want to remind us and all these successful folks up here and all these successful folks in the audience is this is on us. We cannot forget. We cannot move on. We cannot move up. In 2010 census, the fastest growing African-American county, you guys know what it is? Douglas County. Now, I'm an urbanist and I'm gonna always promote Denver. But I just think that that's interesting. And so I think that's a question that we have as a community have to grapple with. Thank you. Councilman Herndon. Thank you, John. And thank you all for coming out tonight, uh, today, and, um, and all the electeds here as well. I will be brief because I know there's a lot of good ideas, and I, I appreciate the mayor and Albus talking about the investments that the city has made. And one of the best investments that I think that we can make as a city is in people. I mean, that is the greatest investment that will generate the greatest return. And I'll talk about some things that have happened out in far northeast Denver. I represent Hiawatha Davis Rec Center all the way out to the border. And one of the things I'm a huge proponent of is financial literacy. 
is that if we talk about this wage gap, it's not as much money as you make, it's as much money as you save. And one of the things that I did is I went to Young Americans Bank, was in Cherry Creek, two months after getting elected, and I spoke to the CEO. And he talked about all these great programs that they do right there in Cherry Creek. And I looked at him and said, people in Montbello and Green Valley Ranch aren't, going, aren't coming down to Cherry Creek. And one of the things that we did is that we, got, we now have a Young Americans Bank out in Green Valley Ranch. One of the things we did is that we had a, young, a financial literacy class that came out to far northeast Denver two years ago, and I sponsored 10 kids from the Montbello Rec Center to come to that class for free. Because if we start to educate our kids about personal finances, that will go a long ways. And that's something that we can do that can be expanded uh, district and citywide. So investment of our financial literacy is one thing. Two, I think that our children today don't see us. And I would ask you all, if you've never heard of Northeast Denver Leadership Week, to write that down and Google it. It's a program I started two years ago where we take kids from Venture Prep High School all the way out to Green Valley Ranch. We take them from a, for a week in the summer, and they're freshmen to senior, and I take them around so that they can meet the mayor, they can meet Senator Johnston. Happy Haynes has spoken to my students. Landry Taylor has spoken to my students. Because if students don't see us, they're never going to believe they can accomplish the things that we have accomplished. So that is a program that we've done for three years now, and that can be expanded to district-wide and city-wide. And I appreciate the mayor and all the people that have spoken to the, our students, because they're students, rock and brown kids, so that they know you can be us and you can be better than us. So I definitely think that's another thing that we can do. And lastly, as we talk about education, I had the opportunity, being a veteran, to go back and get my master's degree, and I graduated in May. And the Army paid for it, but I saw the cost of this degree. And I just thought, higher education is so expensive. And one of the things that I did is I had the opportunity to get to know Nate Easley very well, and he worked for Denver Scholarship Foundation, a program since 2007 has taken 3,000 Denver kids and have given them the opportunity to afford to go to college. And I pressed really hard this summer, unsuccessfully, to try to get a ballot measure so that we can expand Denver scholarships, so that if you were a Denver high school graduate, you had the opportunity to go to college. And I think that is something that I will hopefully continue to push for so that we can, if, you, if we could say as a city that you were a successful Denver graduate and you had the opportunity to go to college, what that would say as a city of Denver and how that we could help our students, I just would think would be something that could put, continue to put Denver on the map. And those are some things that I've hopefully uh, we can continue to, to expand and be successful with. Thank you all very much. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Mike Johnson. Thank you so much for having me and I want to thank John and Sharon again for putting this on. I think like many folks, uh, I woke up this morning with a bit of a broken heart uh, after last night. And I think it felt a little bit like those days when you wake up and you feel broken and you, you're so excited to go to church, right? Because you know it's sort of, you need somebody to help put you back together again. And I felt like this morning, knowing that this event was happening, uh, I think helped all of us get up to get going, to know we had people coming together to talk about some real plans and some real strategies to move forward. And so I want to thank Pastor Hughes, obviously, who was there last night, and Reverend Demmer, and uh, Quincy Shannon, who's here somewhere, who was a fantastic force for peace last night. And so I want to uh, thank all those people who were at the Holly last night um, when we needed you the most. Uh, I just want to talk about two uh, big ideas quickly that I think are going to have the chance to make a big, big impact. And one is when you talk about, and um, we talked a little bit earlier, Sharon did, about the impacts of institutional racism and institutional discrimination and institutional lack of opportunity. And one of the places that we have seen that more powerful than any place is in our school funding formula, is in the way that this state has historically funded kids and funded schools. And uh, if you want to know more, I can talk a lot more about it. But what we have done is we have built a system that actually puts more and more resources into kids that already have all the resources and puts fewer and fewer resources into the kids that need it the most. And so what we are undertaking to do this November on the ballot with Amendment 66 uh, is to finally say it is time for our school finance system to match our values and to make sure that every child in this state has the resources that she needs regardless of what her needs are. And for us, that means things like finally investing in full day kindergarten for every single child in the state. Finally, investing in high quality early childhood education for every three and four year old who we know is likely to enter first grade not yet ready to read. Those things alone close the achievement gap by more than 33 months before a six-year-old girl walks into first grade. We talk about making it possible for the first time to offer schools and districts who want it, extended school days and school years, up to 20 additional days of school per year, which we know is the time when our kids make the most dramatic slide. You talk about the summer learning loss, the summer slide, those are the kids who for those six weeks of summertime aren't going to camps. They're home babysitting little brothers and little sisters so mom can go to work. 
If you want to close those gaps, we got to start by making investments in those kids who need us to stand up and stand in the gap for them, as the mayor says. And so uh, this opportunity to invest in great teachers and great leaders in the schools where we need them, to make sure that the dollars that exist in our system go directly to the kids that are coming into us from families in poverty, that are coming to us from families who are speaking English as a second language, and make sure the teachers and the schools and the families have the resources they're gonna to need to finally be successful. I think this November's ballot gives us historic opportunity to say, uh, it's time for us to invest in the kids that are relying on us, the, on us the most. I think we have not done that yet, but this is our chance to do it. The, the second, I think, and equally important is, as the, the statistic that was mentioned before, which is the most uh, astonishing to me always, I started my teaching career teaching in the Mississippi Delta, and I would come home and folks would say, man, it must be crazy out there in the Delta. Like, I can't imagine how terrible the opportunity must be for the kids you're working with. And then you go back to them that the reality is the day that I took office in this state, you had a worse chance of being a black or brown kid sitting in this auditorium of ever graduating from college than you had growing up anywhere in the Mississippi Delta or anywhere in Alabama or anywhere in Tennessee or Georgia or Texas. That is an absolute embarrassment for our state. But to do that means not only fundamentally changing the K-12 system, it means when our kids graduate from high school ready to go on to college, that they actually have a chance to go because it's affordable. Right? For our Latino families, for a long time, that's meant passing the asset bill, which we passed last year, which said any kid, a valedictorian in Montbello High School or Manual High School, whether they're undocumented or not, if they've done the work and earned the opportunity, they ought to be able to go to college. But most importantly, now it's time for us to deliver the promise that college is actually affordable. Because you've got families who've responsibly been putting money away since their kids were four or five or six. When tuition rates are going up 15% a year, it doesn't matter how much savings you put in, you can't keep track of that. And so that's why this year we're also going to push to make a historic investment into college affordability, and particularly college affordability uh, for our kids who we know are coming from low-income families and got to fight to get their way in there. And so I think, for me, this is, about, uh, this is about fighting for educational opportunity. In this recession over the last three years, folks with college degrees, the unemployment rate never rose above 6%. You want a way to make sure our kids and our grandkids have a great chance of surviving recessions and surviving whatever the economy throws at them, we got to make sure they get degrees after high school. 70% of the new jobs in this state over the next five or 10 years are going to require some sort of post-secondary training. For my money, that means I want our kids in that training. And so uh, when I come out of, of last night and, and wake up this morning, it's about what are we as a community going to do to make sure that we are sending more of our kids, and particularly more of our young men, towards colleges and towards careers, and not towards cages and coffins, because we've done far too much of that. Hold on, man. Hold on, man. Uh, I just want to comment on that real quick. I can talk loud enough. You can hear me. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Javon and John Buckner and Rhonda and Angela pulled me aside before the meeting and said, you know, we want you to give Mike Johnson his honorary black man's card. <laughs> and so today, today we have given Mike his card. You see he has inspired himself. He's talking <laughs> like uh, a brother up here. And so he's sharing the information. And Mike, we're proud and we're glad. Thank you. I want to first say thank you to the Colorado Black Roundtable for convening the community on the Rocky Mountain PBS Losing Ground Report. When the Losing Ground Report came out, the Colorado Black and Latino Democratic Legislative Caucuses automatically responded and started to meet to address these issues. And last year we passed several pieces of legislation that went towards the issues that we see in the disparities. But I want to share with you that we cannot move forward without all of you in this community. So thank you, John. Thank you to everyone who is here. We can pass the legislation. We can fight for it. But we have a greater voice of all of us in this room move forward. So what I'm going to share with you is some of the concepts that we will be looking at to address some of the issues in the Losing Ground Report in the 2014 session. One of the pieces of legislation that we're looking at is to have a racial impact statement performed just like um, when we do a fiscal impact note. When a legislator introduces a piece of legislation, 
we need to understand how that piece of legislation may impact communities of color. And that is an issue we are going to be looking at. Last year, we introduced the State Procurement Disparity Report. All of you know that that law did not pass. We are coming back full force with the State Disparity Report. What this report will do is it will determine if there's disparities in state procurement contracting for minorities, minorities for the disabled, for, the, um, for women and for the disabled and veterans. We are going to need your help to get this piece of legislation passed. All of you need to show up at the Capitol. You need to testify that we need this piece of legislation because we can't determine if there's disparities until we perform the facts. And I would ask you, when we ask you to come, we need you to contact all of your legislators in the House and in the Senate to ensure that we can make equitable business among businesses here in the minority communities. We're going to be running a piece of legislation that will promote safe and affordable lending practices. Many of you know with the recession falling, a lot of people to no fault of their own, their credit is down, they're not able or be in a position in which, they can, um, in which they can buy a home. And so we will be doing some legislation to help people, particularly minorities who have been affected by this, to rebuild and have access to their credit. We will be looking at a piece of legislation called Colorado Employment First. This piece of legislation and this law is currently existing in 26 counties of the 64 here in the state of Colorado. And this is tied to the SNAP program and food assistance programs. And currently, if you are on food assistance, you need to participate in this program to ensure you continue to get your food assistance. And if you do not, you are not eligible for food assistance. And this program will give education, it will give training, and get people back on track and to employment. We will also be looking at a bill to increase the state minimum wage. We've heard a lot in the news. There's a lot of low-hanging jobs <laughs> that are service-type jobs. These jobs right now are only paying a minimum of $7.78 an hour. We will push to increase those service jobs and those, that minimum wage so that people can make a living on these service jobs. We will continue to work with the banking industry and lenders to ensure that we are giving homeowners an opportunity to understand home buying. They will continue to have education. We will continue to help with modification and home preservation events and with the mortgage foreclosure crisis that has occurred in Colorado. So I just want to say thank you. That is a preview of our agenda. We will have more that we will preview to you. But I, I really want to say thank you again, John. Thank you for the iNews report. It was eye-opening. Last night was um, an eye-opening event. I'm saddened by the events, and I think we need to keep everyone involved in our prayers as we move forward and move Colorado forward. Hold on one second. I received a note saying that some of you don't know who these people are. All right. So, Mayor Michael Hancock, Councilman Albus Brooks, Councilman Chris Herndon, State Senator Mike Johnston, State Representative Angela Williams, State Representative John Buckner, State Representative Javon Melton, State Representative Rhonda Fields, City Council Person Happy Haynes. I just want to see if y'all are paying attention. <laughs> Former City Councilman and School Board Member Happy Haynes, Board of Regents Joe Neguse, and our School Board Member Landry Taylor. We will now go to John Buckner. I was actually um, hoping to be last in this group so that I could um, use all the information that's been forwarded to me um, by my colleagues on the stage. Um, one of the advantages of being one of the older legislators is that I can connect um, 
our most recent past from the 60s to now um, and make some of those uh, connections that allow us to know where we've been, how we got there, and what we need to do to overcome some of those things. Um, I think that's an important aspect of what it is that we do. I spent the last 40 years in K-12 education. And most of, when I look back on my job, what I did most was protect my kids from a system that didn't support them. And so the reason um, that I'm in the state legislature now, because quite frankly, I was enjoying my retirement, um, is because I want those systems that are intended to provide for our community to include the entire community. And so we have to get those agendas adjusted so that um, they attend to the needs of the inclusive community. And that's what this is about. That's what this report is saying, is that the systems that we have in place are causing the outcomes that we get. And there's lots of indications of things that interfere with our ability to be successful. But primarily, we get what we intend to from the systems that we set up. And so when the system says that it's failing um, youth of color in education, it's because the system is set up to cause the lack of, of success for students of color. When we change those systems, we will be able to accomplish the things that we need to accomplish in order to cause um, us to be more successful. When we talk about the, the family structure in the black community, by the way, certainly I'm an advocate of um, and have lived my life by that precept that black families are responsible for taking care of their family members. But we should not think that we're an exception. Only 34% of the families in America are a mother, father, and, and children of original birth. And so it's not like we're the only community that has issues around family structure, but the system still adjusts and works for those other people more successfully. So I'm wanting us to pay attention to and get that agenda in place. We have to work on the systemic changes that are necessary. By the way, um, I'm an educator. I told you I was an educator. Um, we have to pass the changes in school finance. It's underfunded regardless of what it is that you're doing. And that underfunding results in significantly less attention being paid to kids of color and the needs of kids of color because we're never been systemically the priority of the system. And so passing this and changing the funding mechanism from one that's based on real estate values to one that's based on income is a big deal. And I want to advocate for the passage of that um, even though I wasn't supposed to. Um, that's what happens when you get old. You do what you want to as opposed to what you're supposed to do. I want to thank um, that group of people, that whole list of people who came bef before us. Who, um, It's difficult being in the legislature today. It's not nearly as difficult as it was in the 70s and the 60s and the 80s to be out there on an island um, on your own. And so I want to thank all those elected officials um, that led the way for this community throughout the history of, of Colorado and everywhere else in this nation um, that worked on these issues. I appreciate the time. I appreciate you being here and listening. Javon, Javon, hold on one second. You know, what's really interesting about this is that these next three legislators, for those John and the next two, these folks are all from Aurora. That's, that's historic in itself. You know, that's historic in itself. So we want to we want to welcome we want to welcome the Aurora legislators to Denver. And we look forward to a meeting like this being held in Aurora where we can be your guests. Javon Milton. 
Thank you so much, John. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I really want to thank uh, iNews for putting together the report because it sheds light in so many different subjects and it helps us in so many of the misconceptions that are out there. Um, as vice chair of the uh, Black Legislative Caucus, I've spent a lot of time these last few weeks dealing with some disparaging comments that were made by a state senator in a task force meeting um, about fried chicken and uh, Hispanics not eating vegetables. Um, I want to thank Representative Fields for being there and having our back at that moment. <laughs> you know, we can't expect to be able to live healthy lives if we're not living in healthy communities, healthy environments. And what I mean by that is if you look around you um, and look in the neighborhoods that you're in, you'll find that you may not have access to the things that are in other areas or other parts of town. Um, if you look at Montbello and Green Valley Ranch, and, and I was so glad that the report pointed out uh, issues about health, if you look in Green Valley Ranch and Montbello, there are only three medical providers in that entire area, an area that uh, has over 30,000 people in it. That's equivalent to a rural community in terms of health care and health provisions. Um, if you look at access to healthy foods and grocery stores, you'll find that they're not in poor areas. If you're in North Aurora, you have one grocery store. Now, if you compare that to an area that I represent, House District 41, which is a middle-income, middle-class area, I've got a hospital, I've got three dozen healthcare providers, I've got three King Supers, two Safeways, one Sprouts, one Target, all in a very small geographic area. And until we can start to move forward and, and bring access, we're not going to be living healthy lives. We're going to be eating poorly and not getting checkups. We've got to continue to push forward the idea that our lives are more than just um, a marginal item that, that can be talked you know, about in a, in a wrongful setting and, and interjected with fried chicken comments. Um, and so uh, we've got to, in, in the legislature, we've got to do more to promote health. We've been working very hard in um, supporting uh, our president in the Affordable Health Care Act. And it was yesterday that the U.S. House, for the 41st time, voted to defund the Affordable Health Care Act. That can't, play, that can't take place. We've got to fight against that, push against that. And so, as Representative Williams had mentioned, having your voices, having your faces down at the Capitol to support us when we are asking for more to be done in our communities is critical and it's crucial. Um, otherwise, what the report shows will continue to happen for decades and generations to come. So again, I thank you all for being here and I thank so much the, uh, the, the organizers of the event and, and the report being done. Our next speaker, on a personal note, said, you know, I didn't want to, I never wanted to do this. But we saw in her a flash of brilliance. We saw a mother who cared about her family. And we decided that in the midst of all that was going on, that if she would put her pain aside and take on the pain of the community to help us in that office, that we would get behind her, and not only her, but Angela and Javon, uh, Tony Exum and Buckner. So Representative Fields, we're real proud of you, girl. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel the love, thank you so very much, thank you. Thank you. If you haven't heard, last night there was a, a, a shooting at a peace rally. My daughter was there and she witnessed the shooting. And it was difficult for her because she saw someone get shot, not just once, not just twice. She tells me five times. So my heart aches because this shouldn't be happening at a peace rally. At a peace rally. You know, everyone has a right to their life. And to have someone take someone's life away with a gun is just really hard for me to understand. So I can relate to everyone's feeling because I feel kind of sad.
by what happened, but I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to be here today to talk about losing ground. And I want to thank the, the Baileys and the Colorado Black Roundtable for what you guys have been doing in the city for a very long time. I because it truly does take engagement. I mean, if you want better government, you have to be involved in it. If you want better schools, you're gonna to have to fight for it. At the State House, I am on a task force. It's called Economic Development and Poverty Reduction. The governor signed for us to be on this commission, and we're looking at poverty. In the state of Colorado, we're about 17% 7, of the people in Colorado live in poverty. In Aurora, in Arapahoe County, we're at 23% poverty. In Denver, it's more like 17%, a little bit close, getting up to about 18%. People are living in poverty. The district that I represent is on Colfax. Colfax and Yosemite is where my district starts. And if you look on Colfax, you see poverty all day long. And when you live in poverty, it's almost like you're, you're living in prison. Because there's, you may not have walls around you, but you're constantly focused on food. And in this commission that I'm on, we were asked to take the SNAP challenge because the average pay that you get for food stamps is $133 a month. That's $4.50 a day. So we were asked to see if we could live on $4.50 a day for one week. I tried it, and my whole focus was on food. Am I gonna have enough to eat? My whole focus is on food. And you heard this past week, at the federal level, they're talking about cutting, what, $4 billion from, $40 billion? $40 billion from food stamps. And when you talk about taking food stamps away for people, which will be millions of people, you're talking about how that's going to affect families, how it's going to affect women. And so there truly is a war on poverty. There is war on poor people. I see it down there at the state capitol when we have people trying to run legislation that is anti-poor people. And with this new legislation, if it's passed with this uh, cutting of food stamps for our nation, they're going to require 20 hours work week, and they're also going to require that you have drug, drug testing. These are kinds of uh, policies that we cannot tolerate in our state. So in this commission, we're trying to have a serious dialogue about what we can do to pull people out of poverty and into mainstream. In doing this dialogue, we have people talking about chicken, really. We have people saying that there's something wrong with black people and, and using things like sickle cell anemia and being a diabetic. I should be able to work at the state house not being um, in, a, in a, an environment that's so insensitive based on the color of our skin. We should not be talking about you know, those kinds of issues. That's not what this commission is all about. So we have two more um, meetings left on this um, task force, and I would like to invite Colorado Black Roundtable to come down to the commission and report to us the findings of what comes out of this today. Because I think that we need to and the, the folks that are on that commission need to hear from our community in reference to what kinds of serious, good public policies we can do to really help people get out of poverty, because it's not easy. Once you lose your home, once you become unemployed, it's hard to get back on track. In Aurora, we have Children's Hospital. They have 300 jobs there. Uh, we have Anschutz Center. They have over 500 job openings. And I see people on Colfax taking the 15, going all the way down to Denver to work because they don't have access to the jobs there. The reason they don't have access to the jobs there is because of the technical skills that they need. That's why we do need to support uh, Amendment 66. <laughs> we need to make sure that our kids and those neighbor, uh, my neighbors and my friends that live in that neighborhood can get jobs right in their own backyard, but they can't even get it. So when I think about minimum wage 
and Javon Melton has, uh, is going to be taking, uh, Representative Milton is going to be taking this issue on. If you're on minimum wage and you have two kids, it's no way you can make it. You are living below the poverty level. In order to make a change as it relates to poverty, we do need to increase meaningful wages so that people can make a living. Because right now, if you're, if you're earning a minimum wage, it's hard to make ends meet. So thank you. I love you all. When my family first came here, one of the first people who reached out to Sharon and myself, besides Regis and Gloria, was the Haynes, Anna Jo and uh, Mike and Leanne and Mary. Uh, and I became very close to Happy. Uh, her and my wife went to school together. Happy is, uh, she's just an outstanding person. Uh, and today, she comes here, having been on the city council for a number of years, and now on the school board. And like I said to Representative Fields, uh, we're very proud of you. But girl, we're real, 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 real proud of the work that you're doing uh, at the school. So happy, good to see you this morning. And thank you, John, and uh, thank you to the Colorado Black Roundtable and CBWPA and the other uh, sponsors of this event, and John and Sharon, you particularly, uh, and uh, Regis and Gloria, uh, for the work that you've done to, um, to really host this necessary uh, community conversation um, and in an ongoing way um, as others have mentioned and like all of you today I'm, I'm here with a heavy heart um, but a renewed resolve a, a renewed resolve for what we've got to do going forward uh, and I don't want to repeat a lot of what uh, many of my colleagues have already said but just per perhaps highlight a couple of those, and I see um, the role that we play as elected officials is many, and one of those is, uh, as our mayor likes to say, um, standing in the gap. Um, and playing defense sometimes is what the, the role is that we play as elected officials. Um, over those things, those things over which we don't have control, but we know that if we're not there standing in the gap, they'll roll over us. And so that, that is part of our role. Somebody talked about the, uh, I think Albus, it was you that talked about the macro and the micro. And, th and, that, and those are our roles. We have roles in policy where we're passing legislation, when we're looking at the 30,000 foot view, where we're working on issues around access to resources and how resources are allocated and where we're looking at providing opportunity. But there's another part of a role. That's the partnership role with all of you in this community and that's connecting those dots because all of the opportunities and all of the legislation and all the policies in the world won't get us very far if we are not prepared from the community perspective, if we're not prepared from the family perspective to take advantage. So you talked about the jobs that are out there and, I, and in, the, in the high tech arena, in the energy field, in the places where all of the jobs that provide living wages and high incomes in this state, uh, Senator Johnson, you mentioned it, in, in just in less than 10 years, 70% of the jobs in this state are gonna require post-secondary education. And so when I look at the report, and thank you, uh, I'll pile on to, and my thanks to the iNews Network. You know, our community already knew this stuff. They live it every day, they feel it, but it helps to put a name on it. It helps to paint a picture. It helps to focus our attention and our actions when we see a report like this that reflects what we know the people in our community are feeling already. And when I look at these numbers and the graphs and the ones that should be going up and the ones that are, uh, should be going the other direction, there's one thing that I think um, uh, um, affects all of those. And that is the education of our children and preparing them to succeed. Preparing them not only to 
get jobs, but preparing them to create jobs in our communities, to be the job creators in our community. And there's an inverse relationship. The higher, the higher the education, the higher the completion rate, the higher um, the number of our children that receive college degrees, and you saw the numbers, it, they're dismal in this state. We lag behind almost every state in this nation. Um, then the lower those poverty rates go in our community. So they are directly related. So I want to talk about, you know, the video that we saw is a powerful image. Um, without words, it, it, it really painted a picture of the reality of the environment that so many of us face, that we face in our community. But I want to point out something that wasn't in that video, and it's, it should be the focus of our attention in our community. Because what was missing in that video was Rachel Knoll standing when that, when that young lady first stopped at a place. And she said, Sugar, it's okay. You can do this. You're smarter than that, and I'm going to help you. What was missing was Regis and Gloria and those that were mentioned before who were standing by that wall and said, don't stop here. You need to go around this wall. And that's how we've come to where we are today. And quite frankly, in that race, and against all those obstacles, the ones that we're trying to, attempting to address with policy and with legislation and with trying to create the resources, yes on Amendment 66, um, to trying to create the resources, we need to make sure that there are many more of us um, in the community standing there at the wall. The barbershop folks who are um, uh, organizing the men, so they're standing next to that wall saying, uh-uh, sister, uh-uh, brother, you can't sit down here. You need to get around that wall or over that wall. And so uh, I just want to say that this is a challenge to us. Um, I look at the progress we've made in Denver Public Schools, and, and we've, you know, cut the dropout rate in half, and that's good. But I want to know, when did dropping out of school become something that was acceptable in our community, that's something that happened. I want to know where, where we are when it comes to setting the expectations, because I know all of us, when we were in school, it was unthinkable. You didn't even think about dropping out of school. And yet, we accept it. And so part of the role that we have in partnership with setting the policies and the legislation and trying to create the right environment is to make sure that we're doing our part in our community, in our churches, in our families, in our organizations, to be there so that we can stand in those places and help all of our children recognize that they can overcome the obstacles because we can't change all those obstacles. We're working on them, but we, we don't have control over all of that. But we do have control over preparing our kids to deal with those obstacles. Thank you. Landry Taylor, our school board member, and another one of my boys. Thank you to uh, the Colorado Black Roundtable. Uh, also, thanks go out to the Honorable Gloria Tanner and Honorable Regis Groff, who really have been the, the, the mentors in my life to understand what is really important in the glue of our community and how you keep that glue there. Uh, just a little bit about uh, this Northeast Denver school district that I am representing. In, this school district, we have more schools in this district than any other district in Denver. Now, what does that mean? Especially here, because what I'm going to end up with is about our house being on fire. What that means in this district is that more kids go to school hungry than any other district. 
What that means in this district is that more kids go from school to jail than any other district. What that means in this district is that there are more homes under foreclosure than any place else in the state. What that means in this district is that with our house on fire, we have a chance and a choice to make as we looked at this report. Our chance and our choice is that we can stand on the sidelines and watch this house continue to burn. Or we can be like so many others that we stand on the shoulders of and run into the house, extinguish the fire, start building and taking the bricks and the mortar and the, and the wood and putting this back together. That's what we have to do. The house is on fire and we cannot stand on the sideline. We have people who we're standing on the shoulders of. When we saw the Freedom Riders do what they did, when we saw those people walk across the Allen Pettus Bridge, when we saw 50 years ago, people did whatever they could do to get to the Washington Monument. They didn't cry about, well, I don't have a bus ticket. Well, it's gonna be hot out there. Well, you know, I'm a little tired. I'll just, I'll just watch it on TV and, you know, maybe read it in the paper. No, no, that, that's, we cannot stand at the curb and watch this house on fire. We have to, we have to go in. We have to run in. We're dependent on us. There is no Superman. There is no Superman. It's us. So, so this is really about, you know, and I, and I, and I applaud and I think, I thank all of our, 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 our representatives up here who are doing this, this incredible work. I mean, you read about it and you see it on TV, the, that house on, on Broadway and, and Colfax, I mean, they're in there every day trying to put this fire out, put that fire out, and build something, build something great at the same time, having to put a fire out. But those are, those are the policy, policy things that, that we have to show up for. We have to run into that house on Colfax and Broadway and support them. We cannot have them be there unless we make sure we've got their back. Because funny things happen up there. Funny things, people start talking about people that eat chicken. People that eat chicken. Oh my God, people that, well, I, you know, uh, my God. <laughs> so let's, let's be clear. We are here to move to action today because we have heard great information. We've seen the information, the facts, we cannot take a timeout anymore. Timeout is over. Timeout is over watching the house burn. It's time for action. Join, join your neighbor. Join your children. Join your family. Let's all run into the house. Put the fire out. Start building it back up again. Thank you, John, for this opportunity. Hold on, John. All right, so the house is on fire, and these elected officials and the rest of us got to run in and try to save the children and the family. But in many cases, who started the fire? Who was continuing to let the fire burn? And what do we do in identifying maybe a new fire chief? And so today, in terms of trying to make sure that folks get their rights in Colorado, the right to vote, the right to vote in a timely fashion, we're trying to get a new fire chief. And that fire chief is going to be Joe Neguse. Would y'all please welcome candidate for Secretary of State, who is also on the Board of Regents at the University of Colorado, and the gentleman who's going to help us know which house to go into so that we don't go in the wrong house. Thank you, John. 
I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to re-elect Landry Taylor to the school board, I think, after that speech. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Uh, I, I want to mention two people, and Happy touched on this uh, a moment ago, and Gloria mentioned this when she started uh, about an hour ago. It's not enough to have folks on our city council and on our school board and in the legislature. Uh, we need to make sure that we have representation at all levels of government. Uh, I'm only the second African American to serve on the Board of Regents at CU in almost 150 years of its existence, and the first was Rachel Knoll, and she deserves a round of applause. <laughs> the second thing I want to do, and I know we're not, I'm not going to get too political, but my term ends in 15 months, and there will be no African Americans on the board unless we elect a young, talented woman out of Aurora, a black woman named Nikita Ricks, who is here in the audience. I, I do not want to be repetitive of my colleagues. Uh, they have already identified, I think, to me, the, the losing ground report is staggering, and as Happy mentioned, we already knew this was going on. And with respect to higher education, at least my perspective, having served on the Board of Regents for five years, uh, it is astounding, and it's a tragedy. You think about the number of African-American students, the number of Latino students at the University of Colorado Boulder, the state's flagship institution. Those numbers having not changed since I was a student 10 years ago. Uh, it, at the end of the day, we have got to change it. And you all know that. I know that. The folks on this stage know that. It's not just retention. It's also recruitment. Uh, Councilman Herndon mentioned this on scholarships. We know what the problem is, right? I mean, there are talented young black kids here at Manual who do not go to our state's flagship institution because it's too expensive and because they're not getting scholarships. In other states, if you look at the empirical data, they are doing far better because they are investing. Uh, we had a problem at our medical school at CU out in Aurora at the Anschutz campus several years ago where the accrediting agency, the national accrediting agency, took us to task and said we did not have enough African-American and Latino and minority students to become doctors in our community. We invested money, scholarship money, and lo and behold, what happens? We get more students, more talented minority students, because we're willing to invest in them. We are working on retention, and as was mentioned, we're making progress at CU Boulder, but I will say, I mean, it's not a coincidence that we're 48th in the, in the nation, 48th, 49th usually, uh, in public funding for higher education, and we have such astoundingly low rates of both retention uh, and enrollment with respect to minority students. We have got to change the way in which we see higher education in the state of Colorado as a public and a community good. And the first step to doing that is passing Initiative 66 this fall, which will do a lot for K through 12, and will help bridge the gap for higher education the next cycle. The final thing I will mention, uh, John touched on this. Uh, we really do stand on the shoulders. I think I'm probably the youngest guy on the stage. Uh, we stand on the shoulder. <laughs> yeah, they're looking at uh, it's Mayor Hancock's looking at me funny. Um, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We have not had a Democratic statewide candidate since Regent, Regis Groff ran for lieutenant governor almost 30 years ago. I'm running for Secretary of State right now, the office currently held by Scott Gessler. And you, if you wanna talk about losing ground, the common thread to all of this, our ability to improve educational opportunities for our kids, our ability to restore and to change income inequalities in our communities is all tied together by our ability to participate in our democracy by exercising our right to vote. And that right has been under attack across the country. You saw it with the Supreme Court's decision just five, three, four months ago uh, with respect to the Voting Rights Act. You see it in North Carolina, in Texas with voter ID laws. We have got to be vigilant about protecting our right to vote so that we can continue to have the great representation that we have in our community. So thank you, John. Thank you, Sharon. What you all are doing is so important, and I'm just so humbled to be a part of your community and to help you in your cause. A couple of housekeeping issues real quick. Uh, Joe mentioned uh, the young lady from who's going to be running to replace him. 
but we also would behoove us to talk about Marlo Austin and Maya Wheeler, who are also running, to add on to this list of black. Marlo is running, Marlo is running in Denver, and Maya is running for city council at large in Aurora. Two, each one of these people, uh, because there are a lot of blacks throughout the state, each one of these people don't, let it, don't only just represent their district, but they represent black folks throughout the state. And we learned that when there was just Regis and Gloria and a few others uh, in the state house. Thirdly, um, politics is not just about politics. It's about politics, programs, but also about personalities. And when you get down there, you'll learn about the personalities that are there. Fourthly, a question to each one of you, and I just get a show of hands. Can the round table count on each one of you in your office as we move forward with the Losing Ground Report? Can I see a show of hands? Thank you. <laughs> Fifthly, I missed somebody in acknowledging all the elected officials who went before, and I, I got to make sure I deal with this correctly because when I ran for city council, she beat me solidly. And if Elba's here, would y'all please just acknowledge Elba Wedgworth, who's with us today. Uh, she, 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 she still runs me and she still beat me solidly. And then lastly, let me thank all of the elected officials for coming to this historic gathering, thanking you again for your time and your talents and your energy and your resources. Uh, and with that said, we will now move towards the community panel one. If you would please come up. Our elected officials, you are dismissed, and thank you so much for your time.